What's up, guys? My name is Mouton. I get to be the lead pastor of Relevant Church, and I'm so glad that you decided to tune in to one of our message replays. I believe that God has a word for you. Hey, listen, if you want to continue to support Relevant Church to be able to produce content that teaches the gospel and leads people to hope, go ahead and give a gift of any amount to giving.thisisrelevant.cc. You can sign up for recurring giving or give a one-time gift, but I want to let you know, every gift matters and allows us to take the gospel beyond our community, region, and world. So thanks for tuning in. Hopefully you are blessed by this message. Peace. Imagine if you will, being married to your college sweetheart. You've been married for 22 years. You've got three beautiful children. Everything in life seems to be going exactly the way it's supposed to be. You guys have settled in your careers. You guys have the house that you wanted. Your kids are doing great in school. You've got the cars that you want. You're essentially living the American dream. You've got money in the bank. And you're on the phone with your spouse as they're driving back in from out of town. And you're excited to see your spouse, and you're excited to reunite because your spouse has been gone on a business trip for a week. And as you're hurrying to get home to meet your spouse at home, they never show up. Hours pass, and they still haven't shown up. You start calling, And they're not picking up the phone. And when you just lay down, just say, well, I'm going to take a little rest, you get a phone call. And it's a state trooper from out of state that says, hey, are you the spouse of so-and-so? And And you answer, yes. Is everything okay? They said, well, you need to get to this state immediately because your spouse has been involved in an accident. So you get up, drive two states over, have no clue, no one is telling you anything. You're talking to family members who've also received that call, and they're saying, well, we've talked to the hospital. You should just get there. Well, do you know anything about the situation? No, you should just get there. You get to the hospital. When you get there, the first people to meet you is security. And they said, we'll walk you up. You go, and you're saying, well, where's my spouse? Can I go see him? Can I go see him? You'll see him in a minute. The doctor just needs to talk to you. You go, you sit in a quiet room, and the doctor comes to tell you that your spouse was gone. They were dead on arrival. So for the last five hours, your greatest fear just came alive. And you begin the grieving process. Months go by, you have to talk to your kids about them losing their parent, their other parent. And as they get to the point of grasping the reality of this about a year later, You're still grieving, but you're finally finding a bit of happiness in days. The days aren't so cloudy. You go to the doctor and you discover you've got cancer. So now you've got the fear that your children, who've already lost one parent, might lose you. And so you start a new journey over the next year. That's my sister's story loses her husband of 22 years, only to find out a year later that she's got breast cancer and must have a double mastectomy. Imagine the loss, imagine the tragedy, imagine the pain that she's had to endure. Imagine being young Having the individual who's supposed to love you, supposed to take care of you. The individual who's supposed to 
teach you about life and teach you about uh, how to live protected and how to live covered and, and how to stay away from bad people. And the person you're supposed to run to, who's supposed to be your protector, becomes your abuser. The person who's supposed to protect your innocence is the one who takes your innocence. The person you're supposed to look up to and call dad and call uncle and call brother is the very same person who is taking advantage of your little body. Imagine having to walk through life in a household where you live with your abuser, where you have to smile around your abuser, where you have to be okay in public and act like everything is just fine. Imagine you've just gone through incredible, Heart-wrenching surgery and sickness with your spouse. You've been there holding their hand. You've prayed over him, prayed over them, praying for a miracle, praying for God to do something, praying for God to heal their body, praying for God to protect the family, keep everybody together. God, this is not the right time. God, I need this person in my life. And them experiencing the miracle of healing just to find out a couple months later that you're sick too now. But it's not getting better for you. It seems hopeless for you. Now you have to walk through life knowing that there was healing over here, but that same healing doesn't seem to be coming for you. And you've got to carry the pain and the shame and the sickness and the hurt and the burden. Because while there's healing on one side, they're not out the woods yet, totally. But it seems like you're worse off. One more. Imagine growing up in hardship. Imagine not having a lot as you're growing up, not having access to the resources everybody else has. And all you can do is try to make life the best that it can be. You're growing up in a single parent home. You've had to fend for yourself because your single parent has to go work and take care of the bills. And so you're home alone with a sibling or maybe by yourself. And while you're supposed to be experiencing the innocence of childhood, you're experiencing the burden of having to adult fast. You're cooking, you're cleaning, you're taking care. You're walking into the house by yourself. You're young. You're seven, you're eight years old. You've got a key to the house. You've got to find your way home. One parent is estranged and not in the picture. They can't protect you. And as life would have it, things go from bad to worse because the one parent that you do have in your house falls sick. And so now you move from housekeeper to caretaker. And you're not even a teenager yet. And now the burden is on you to care for somebody who was supposed to care for you.
and it's not getting better. It's just getting worse and worse and worse. And you're trying to wrap your mind around it being a young preteen. Now you're in your teenage years and all you've known is tragedy, hurt, abandonment, pain. You're seeing the one person that you can't even help. Who's, there, who's supposed to be there for you, but you've got to be there for them, only to lose them at a young age, and now you're by yourself. These are all real stories of people sitting in these seats. What happens when every time you go to the doctor, it's bad news? It's worse news. The bills are mounting up. The pressure is mounting up. The pain is mounting up. The fear is mounting up. The frustration is mounting up. And all you can say is, God, do you even see me? God, you're supposed to be a good God. Can a good God really be good when all of this is taking place? God, you're taking care of everybody else, but how come I don't ever see you take care of me? I see you answering everybody else's prayers, but you never answer mine. God, are you even real? Are you even there? Because I can't feel you. I can't touch you. I can't hear you. God, why does it have to be this bad for me? Let me ask you, is God good in the midst of pain and loss and hardship? We know the theological responses. However, oftentimes, if we're honest, our emotions and our expressions put our religious niceties to the test. Many of us have asked the question, why, 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 why is this happening to me? Many of us have cried, God, make it stop. Make them stop. Change my situation. God, rescue me. Rescue me. You're the rescuer, right? Rescue me. You're the healer, right? You're Jehovah Rapha. Heal me. You're Jehovah Jireh, right? God, provide for me. I've got nothing. What happens when there's no answer? What happens when it's as quiet as it is in the room? What happens when there's no change? And there's just more of the same. Is God good when everything is not? In the book of Job, we find a very familiar story. Job is one of the most familiar books in the Bible. But it's familiar because of the expressions of the main protagonist, not necessarily familiar because of the story. It's familiar because it speaks a lot of the human condition and what we experience in life and how we experience life. If you want to talk about the realities of tragedy, of misfortune, of burdens, Job is a book that can speak to the reality of how many of us experience life. Now, listen, I'm not asking you to compare Job's story with your story. I'm asking you to look at Job's story and look at yours and say, his pain is his pain and mine is mine. Because no one can actually tell you your pain is not bad enough. Nor can you say someone's pain is worse than yours. Because the reality is, pain is at the level of the carrier. 
for one person stubbing their toe is as bad as another person breaking a limb. I know, because I don't like pain. If I get the flu, you might as well tell me I'm dying tomorrow. I am a mess. I told you when I was in college and I got sick, what did I do? I went to my mama's house. I don't like pain. The author of Job is unknown, but the stories have been corroborated through scripture and through time. Job is filled with prose that's connected to poetry and wisdom, much like can be find, found in the Proverbs. When you read Job and you read Proverbs, you find very similar sentiments, very similar wise sayings. Job, give you a background on this guy named Job. Job lived in the ancient Near East, meaning around the Middle East area, around 2500 to 2000 BC, around that time. That's where the narrative takes place. Some writers have said that he could have been, and this is for all the history buffs here, that he could have been a contemporary of Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. So Job, don't isolate Job as, hey, just this random story. It's, this is taking place in the whole biblical narrative. In verse 1, we begin the story of Job. I want you to follow along with me. We're going to read a couple of verses at a time that I'm going to teach a little bit and then read a couple of verses and teach a little bit more. It says, there was a man in the land of Uz. That's a funny name. Uz. Whose name was Job. And that man was blameless. Everybody say blameless. blameless. And upright. Everybody say upright. One who feared God and turned away from evil. There was born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. So this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. This man from us, Job from us, was blameless. He was blameless. The Hebrew word that, that, that is translated to blameless is called tam. It means he had a general purity before God, not perfection. This is very important that you guys catch that. He was blameless before God. He was pure before God. It was general purity, not perfection. It talks about his integrity and his innocence and his dealings. He was a good guy. He was upright. He was ethically straight. He was an honest man. Yashar, that means upright, means to be obedient to God in all things. It tells us that he feared God. He feared God. This is not the fact that he was scared of God. This was not like he shuddered and trembled before God. No, no. Fear God is something that we see all through Scripture. The Scripture tells us to learn to fear God. This is a reverent attitude of respect. He gave God honor where honor was due. He was obedient to God. He trusted God. And fearing God is often associated with having wisdom. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So when you're obedient, when you trust God, when you respect God, then you begin to be wise. Because wisdom will tell you God is bigger than you are. It says he turned from evil. Turned from evil. That means he, he, he not only rejected wickedness, because you know sometimes it's like somebody invites you to do something that you shouldn't be doing, and you say no, but in your heart you kind of want to do it, but you just don't want to get in trouble, you don't want to look bad. 
that if all the situation was just right, you might get into that? Okay, maybe it's just me. Um, it said he rejected wickedness, but not only just rejected what was bad, he actually pursued what was good. Every single day, he lived in pursuit of doing right, of honoring God, of honoring people, of serving the Lord in the best possible way. This wasn't just a default goodness. He actually got up every single day and said, God, how can I please you today? I wonder what would happen if we woke up in the morning like that. God, I choose you. God, I want to please you. God, I just want to walk in step with you. Where it's not just kind of like we avoid bad because it's bad, but we pursue good because it is close to the heart of God. What if we lived with that sort of attitude? And back in the day, wealth was calculated by how many animals that he had. And this man has 7,000 sheep. I don't like animals that much, y'all. When we go to the fair, I stay here clear of the little agriculture place. I don't like the way animals smell. I don't like the way they look. Animals are gross. Anybody who knows me and has a dog in their house, let's I would be at Angie in Denver's house, and their little dogs come, and everybody's like, oh, look at it. And I'm like, ugh. Just get away. Nava, stop. This man has 7,000 sheep, and he's called extremely wealthy. This man is extremely wealthy. He's got 7,000 sheep. How do we know that he's extremely wealthy? Because in, uh, in a different scripture, in Chronicles, we hear about a guy named Nabal, and he says that he was very rich, but he only had 3,000 sheep. 3,000 sheep. Job had 7,000 sheep. So he's extremely, extremely wealthy. And his family, the way his family's made up, he's got seven sons and three daughters. And this time, that was a perfect family. You got a couple of girls who grow and learn from their mama. But I got seven sons who can take over the family business and work alongside of me. Everybody looks at him and says, my gosh, this man is blessed. He's got everything he needs. He's got more than American dream. This dude, in our estimation, in our day, in 2003, he's flying private, staying in the most posh hotels, doesn't have a need in the world, can spend whatever he wants to spend. He is very, extremely wealthy. He's got more than everybody else. It says he was the greatest man in the land in the East. He was great because of his wealth. He was great because of his integrity. He was great because he was blessed by God. He was blessed his family. He was great because of his family. Then it goes on, it goes on, tells us a little bit more about his family. Verse 4, it says, his sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. I'm going to read that again. His sons used to go out and hold a feast in their house, each one on his day. They would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. They used to turn up. Middle Eastern parties, like I said a couple of weeks ago, did not just last a day. These lasted days. There was money involved. We don't know if this was birthday celebration. We don't know if this was just seasonal celebrations. All we know is Job's sons used to turn up. And they used to invite their sisters to come and eat and drink with them and have fun and, and celebrate like these guys had everything that they needed. Imagine just having access to money and opulence and being able to just throw parties whenever you want to. Through parties. These were epic. These were crazy. These were wild. How do we know? Because when the days were over, verse 5, and the feast had run their course, so the feast had run their course. You know a party is crazy when it's, it's got to let you just let it run its course. <laughs> just let it run its course. <laughs> no, the party didn't end. It just ran its course. Job would send and consecrate them. And he would rise early in the morning off a burnt 
offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. That God, that Job did continually. After the party had ran its course, Job knew his kids. Every parent in here knows their children. And we know some of our kids, if they were to throw a party, we might need to go get them and purify them (laughs) and pray over them. Anoint them with, oh, I don't know what y'all did at that party. But I know you, you are my child. He would go, he would, he would take them, and he would take them through their religious uh, uh, purifying exercises, and he would sacrifice on their behalf. This means he would pray for them, he would intercede for them. He would go to God's feet and say, Lord, I know my kids. They're kind of crazy. And just in case they sinned against you, I want you to forgive them. I don't know about you, but have you ever prayed? I know my parents prayed for me a lot. I would go out, and my parents would just tell me, <laughs> we're praying for you. Because they just knew. They just knew that if I wasn't at home and I was out, I told you I had a conversation with my dad where I was like, Dad, just, you know, just let me be. Let me live my life. I can imagine Job having this conversation with his sons after their party. He's like, come on, come on again. We're going to go pray. God, Dad, come on. Just let me live my life. And he's praying for them. He's interceding for them. He's saying they might have sinned or cursed God, not necessarily in their words. It could have just been in their actions. Could have just been the way they've lived their lives. This makes a case for Job's desire for holiness and purity. He was an upright man. This all makes sense, and you'll, you'll wonder why, you'll understand why I'm spending so much time rehearsing and telling you about how good he is and how blameless he is and how upright he is and how he's doing everything right by God, how he wants to honor God even when his kids act out of pocket. He steps in the gap for his kids and say, I want to pray for you. He is a good man. Come on, everybody say this. Job is a good man. Job is a good man. He's a good man. He loves God. He honors God. He respects God. So what comes next is very, very interesting because we wonder, why do bad things happen to good people? Verse 6, now there was a day when the sons of God, sons of God, translated bin Elohim, means angels or spiritual beings in other places in Scripture. It's translated as angels. Whenever you see in the Old Testament, sons of God, is talking about spiritual created beings that that God has. Uh, These are probably the angels. It says, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. I like like that laugh because I wanted to laugh too. (laughs) Because how interesting is this? You got kicked out of heaven. What the heck are you doing back there? Ain't supposed to be here. God calls a council, and think about it like this. We were just watching Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, uh, was it yesterday or two days ago or something? Just think about, like, one of the, uh, uh, what was that thing called? What, what is Guardians of the Galaxy? What group is that? Not DC, it's Marvel. There you go. Think about, like, one of the councils. All of the supreme beings are gathered together in this moment, and God being the ultimate supreme being, sitting at this council with all of these other spiritual leaders all throughout the galaxies. It says, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves to God. They're coming to be in council with God, and then Satan shows up. Now, the interesting thing is we've come to learn Satan as the name of Lucifer, the devil, but in Scripture, as we're getting to that point, in the New Testament, we see it more as a pronoun. Here, it's really just a title given to the accuser. It says the accuser, the adversary. Satan shows up, and then God 
says this, from where have you come? God knew where Satan was. Just want to let you know. God is not aloof to what happens in this world. He just asked him flat out in conversation. Remember he did that to Adam too? It's not because he had lost Adam in the Garden of Eden when Adam sinned against him. When he says, Adam, where were you? It wasn't like God was like, oh, no, I lost Adam. What happened? It's just conversation. Sometimes we ask our kids, you know you catch them doing bad. What were you doing? You know what they were doing. You know sometimes we make our kids lie. <laughs> Because we know exactly what they were doing. What were you doing? Nothing. If you wouldn't have asked them, they wouldn't have lied to you. He says, from where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. These words here actually mean in the Hebrew that somebody is going out in search of something. They're looking for something to get into. So Satan responds to God when God says, where were you? What you been doing? Satan is like, man, I've been looking for something to get into. You know who I am. You know I'm that adversary. Don't act like you don't know what I'm about. I'm looking for somebody who I'm trying to get. <laughs> and then God Oh, God. And the Lord said, have you considered my servant Job? No, God. Bad, no. God, please, no. Listen, if Satan goes to heaven and is in counsel with the Lord, God, do not mention my name. Just act like you don't know me. Pick somebody else. He knows that Satan is walking all over the earth. The accuser is walking all over the earth to get into something. How do we know that? Because 1 Peter 5.8 tells us this. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, your Satan, your adversary, same words, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. God knew this. God knew Satan was trying to get into something crazy. God knew Satan was trying to mess with somebody. And God baits him. Have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man. Same words at the beginning. Who fears God and turns away from evil. Same words at the beginning. Then Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for no reason? God is like, you see my guy? Seen the homie Job. It's my dude. Blameless. Upright. Fears God. Turns away from evil. And the accuser does what the accuser always does. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions and have increased in the land. He accuses Job of having ulterior motives of following God. He says the only reason he follows you is because you bless him. He knows not to go against you because if he does, he might lose his possessions. So actually, Job is self-preserving. That's the only reason why he follows you. But then he blames God too. So not only does he accuse Job, he accuses God too. Well, you know what? You're just out here trying to be all Mr. Benevolent and stuff and take care of this guy. You're coddling him. You're, you're protecting him. He starts blaming God of favoritism. Satan is just a miserable, bitter hater. Just hating for no reason. First lesson you can take away from this message is we have a real enemy that we have to contend with in life. You have a real accuser. You have a real adversary. And so Satan decides to pose a challenge, but stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. Stretch your hand. 
what he's actually asking God to do, he says this, take away all he has viciously. Don't do it nicely. Don't let him just lose it. Touch him. Frustrate him. Destroy him. And he will curse you to your face. And how does God respond? My Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your hand. All that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. Verse 13 through 19, we experience the most tragic day in Job's life. Now, there was a, there was a day when his sons and daughters, talking about Job's, were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and there came a messenger to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabians, these are raiders, fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone escaped to tell you, they killed all of your servants, and they raided all of your animals. While he was yet speaking... They came another and said, the fire of God, this fire of God is probably lightning, fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I have alone escaped to tell you. All the 7,000 sheep, gone. While he was yet speaking, I want you to see this. People are coming one after another. The conversation ain't even over yet, and he see another servant running towards him. He receives bad news over here, and another person is running towards him. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, in the midst of pain, isn't it crazy how life gets gets to you while you're down and keeps punching you and kicking you? I'm already down. I'm already hurting. What more can I take? Everything is already going bad. While he is yet speaking, there came another and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking in their oldest brother's home. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young people and they're dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. He loses his wealth and his children in one fell swoop. I've always said this, you gave the enemy an inch, he wants to take the whole roadway system, forget a mile. Satan Satan wants to go for the jugular, he wants to take you out. Satan wants to destroy us, he doesn't just want to hurt us. That's why it's important that we don't play with Satan. That's why we don't play with the devil, that's why we don't dabble and act like, oh, you know, it's crazy because we live in a society where evil, we become so desensitized to evil, it's all over the screen, it's in movies, it's in music, and we're like, oh no, it's just art. It's not art, it's demonic. Satan is trying to rock you to sleep so you don't believe that he actually exists. The greatest trick of the devil, what, is to convince you that he does not exist. And I know very many Christians who are like, you know, we talk about evil a lot, but the reality is like Satan doesn't really do stuff in, in this world. He doesn't, we, he doesn't have as much control. He doesn't have as much power. Are you crazy? Look around. Look around. Watch the evening news and you'll know how much power Satan has. Watch music videos. Watch concerts. And you will see very quickly that the enemy is walking around like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. Satan doesn't just want to hurt you. He doesn't want to distract you. He wants to destroy you. Job's worst day of his life, he loses everything. What does he do? Verse 20, then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshiped. Wait, what? Job has two responses. The first one, he expresses deep grief. He tears his clothes. 
You ever been so hurt? You ever been so dejected and so lost and so frustrated that you begin to rip the clothes off your body, ripping the hair out of your head? He begins to cry and lament. He's expressing a deep, 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 deep grief. He shaves his head, but in the next moment, he falls to the ground and worships. Can I tell you that his fall, lest you think that he fell to the ground out of this involuntary grief that he had. No, I believe everything that we've seen about Job. Job voluntarily condescending himself in a moment of humble genuflection and says, God, you are still good. God, you're still trustworthy. I may have lost everything, but God, I still believe in you. I still believe. I still believe. How do we know? He says, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Naked I came. He says, listen, I ain't brought nothing into this world, and I ain't taking nothing with me. God gave and God take away. What is he saying? All that I have was God's in the first place. He reserves the right to take it back whenever he wants to. What? Imagine having that much faith. Imagine having that much resolve. No matter what bad news I get, naked I came in, naked I'm going out. I didn't bring nothing in it, and I ain't taking nothing out. Blessed be the name of God. He's still on the throne. The interesting thing is Job doesn't focus on the tragedy his entire focus is on the divine prerogative. God can do what he wants because he is God. Blessed be God. Now, the response that I just experienced from all of you all in here was real nice. Woo, yeah! Until you're in the midst of that moment. Yeah, God is good. Yes, we stand with the Lord as long as that don't touch me. <laughs> Lesson number two, if you want to take notes, how you respond to suffering is an indicator of what you believe about God. How you respond to suffering is an indicator of what you believe about God. In verse 22, it says, in this... In all of this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. I want y'all to think about that for a second. In all of this, Job did not sin, nor did he charge God with wrong. Interesting. Chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, same situation is played out again. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. Why do you keep showing it? Satan, I know there had to be somebody at the divine council that was like, man, why is this guy here? You were not invited to the cookout. <laughs> Did you get kicked out? You know, when you're sitting around and somebody shows up that's not supposed to be there, y'all just in a... Don't act like you don't talk about people who ain't supposed to be there. <laughs> Every single one of y'all do it. And listen, if you don't talk, talk about it publicly, you talk about it with your spouse. Yeah. Can you believe that they were there? Hey, didn't he get kicked out of heaven? <laughs> I heard he was tripping. Jesus letting him up here. Shoot, imagine if I was to do the same thing. God would have not let me up there. <laughs> Tell me you ain't thought about it. God walks in the room. Hey, God, how are you? Oh, man, it's a good day. So you let everybody up in the room. <laughs> and the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come from again? 
Satan answered, the Lord said, from going to and fro on the earth again and from walking up and down it again. And the Lord said to Satan again, have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on earth, a blameless, upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. God, okay, we got the point. Job is good. But he adds a little caveat at the end. He says he still holds fast his integrity. Although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. You wanted me to destroy him without reason. He still has him broken. My guy Job's a gangster. Don't play with him. Listen to the way Satan responds. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. When you see how Satan responds to God, responds to God, you can see just the trajectory of the hate, of the malice, of just the dysfunction in his character. He speaks to God as if God is some common individual. Skin for skin. Somebody at the table, oh. All that a man has, he will give for his life. Skin for skin. This is a crass statement making another accusation about Job for being shallow. What is he saying, skin for skin? Uh, Really, what he's trying to articulate is like, listen, of course he still follows you. Because any, anyone would give up somebody else's skin to save their own skin. That's what he's saying. That's the accusation. Oh, Job is just shallow. He just does what everybody else would do. For the sake of self-preservation, they'll give up whoever. They'll snitch. They'll throw somebody under the bus. They'll lie to protect themselves. Verse 5, but stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. Man. He says, listen, you touch his body, he'll curse you to your face. You you, You bring him to the brink of death. He will curse you. And can we just be real? In this room, pain will cause you to lose your religion. See, financial loss is one thing. Losing people you love is another thing. But what would people give to get their health back? What would people sacrifice just to feel whole again? Losing one's health is the ultimate test of mental and spiritual fortitude. That's why anybody who goes through tragic health crisis who remain faithful get my utmost respect. And what does God say to him? Behold, he is in your hand. Again. Only spare his life. I love that, only spare his life. In the first statement, he says, don't touch him. Touch everything he has. Don't touch him. In this one, touch his body. Only spare his life. Lesson number three, Satan can't do anything without divine limitations. I need y'all to know that right now. Satan can't do anything without divine limitations. So what does he do? Verse seven through nine. So Satan went out in the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome swords from the sole of his feet and the crown of his head. And it took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in ashes. I'm going to invite the band to come up. The sores are the same language 
that is used in the boils that affected Egypt during the plagues. This is the same language that God uses against those who would break the law, the same curse that he would give them. It was an incurable, deadly disease. This is what Job has. But I want y'all to understand the pain that Job is in. Job has an incurable, deadly disease. But God says, don't take his life. So he doesn't even have the consolation of death to rescue him. I am just going to live in this suffering for however as long as it takes. There's people who've been on their sickbed who have been dying who said, Lord, take me now. Death is greater than having to deal with the lifetime of this. But Job doesn't even get that rescue. Death is the only way that he can escape right now, and he doesn't even get that. He has to suffer. It says he sat in ashes. He grabbed a piece of pottery and scratched his boils, and he sits in ashes. This may indicate at this point now he's lost everything. He's lost his children. He's now lost his health. And in this day and age, if you were sickly like that, if you had that tragedy or misfortune hit you, you know what they said? God has cursed you. And because you are cursed, we don't want that curse around us. So more than likely, him sitting in ashes is he's become an outcast. He's living outside of the city, sitting in trash heaps where the rest of the outcasts had gone. This was a good man, a blameless man. An upright man who feared the Lord, who turned away from evil. This is the one that God says, look at him. He is good. Job's wife shows up. Job's wife shows up. She says, do you still hold fast to your integrity? She uses the exact same words God used. Job, my son, even though you have messed with him, he still holds fast his integrity. She comes and she uses that as an accusation against him. And then she goes on and said, curse God and die. Are you dumb? God don't love you. You crazy? God is not with you. You lost everything. You think God is for you? Everything that happened to your life, you think that God is still real? You think God is still on his throne? You think God cares about you? Do you understand what you've gone through in life and you're still praising God? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're still going to do that church thing again. After all God did to you, you're still going to go and praise him and worship him. You still believe in this God, but yet you're still not out of financial debt. You keep praying. You sing that song, Jehovah Jireh, my provider. What has he provided? It's time for you to start providing for yourself. Oh, God is the healer. Yeah, but you're dying. Oh, God is still good. You forgot what happened to you when you was a kid. How would God be so good and he let that happen to you while you were a child? All these innocent babies dying all over the world. Everybody being taken advantage of. This God is good. Curse God and die. Maybe she's tired of seeing her husband suffer. Maybe she's stuck in a marriage now and he can't provide and she just wants to get out so she can go remarry and move on with her life. He responds to her. He says, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Foolish women. He's not talking about intellectually stupid. He's talking about immorality. 
Oh, I, I see what you're up to, wife. I see what you're doing here. Oh, you, you, you've been hanging. Oh, oh the, girls, the girls at the salon have gotten to your head, haven't they? And I'm drama-filled. Them girls are unhappy anyway, but yet they're getting to your head now. They're trying to convince you. you you've been hanging out with those unsavory, uncouth girls. Oh, I see what's happening right now. Shall we receive good from God? And shall we not receive evil? Is God a genie in the bottle? We just rub him the right way, and he's supposed to give us every wish and grant us every desire of our heart? Is that what we think about God? Should we accept only the good things? Oh, God is good, and when evil comes, oh, God is bad. Should we accept good and not adversity from God? That's the biggest question in these first few chapters. And that's the biggest question many of us are going to have to face. Is God good? even when he lets Satan touch you. Is God good when he calls out your name in front of the adversary that doesn't want anything more than to destroy you and he sends him? Is God good when he lets Satan touch you? All the indications to Job, remember, he has no clue about the conversation that just took place in the divine council. He has no clue about the cosmic conflict that's at work. All the indications just tell Job, God has forgotten about you. God has left you. After all the tragedy and loss, his only consolation is this. God is sovereign over it all. He gives and he takes away. Is God good even when he lets Satan touch you? At this point, Job says yes. At this point. Are you that confident? Are you that resolved? How do you answer that? Here's the truth. Here's the truth. And uh, let, let's stop all the religious niceties. Some of us feel dejected by God. We feel disconnected and rejected by God. Some of us have even stopped praying. Yeah, we show up to church. But we stop praying. We stop asking for a miracle. We stop believing that God can do it or will do it. Some of us have gotten to the point where we've stopped praising God. We walk in the church and everybody else worships and we know we're supposed to be there, but we do nothing. We look around in judgment and critique of everybody else. Why is everybody so emotional? Oh, church is such an emotional place. What is wrong with this place? It's not really that real. It's not that serious. What's, I'm just, I just don't understand. What is this all about? We become cynical. We become cynical. We criticize everything, but we call it being real. I'm just a realist. We're mad. We're angry. We're holding pain. We've lost our joy. We've lost our ability to connect spiritually. Every time I read the word of God, it doesn't do anything for me anymore. I listen to the songs. It doesn't do anything for me anymore. Anytime I encounter anything spiritual, it's just kind of going through the motions. So, you know, every once in a while, I pick up the Bible out of duty. But most of the times, I just let it go. I just go on my day because at the end of the day, God didn't come and rescue me. So I got to do it myself. Our faith has become nothing 
at worst, but rote religiosity. It's just form and function. We show up because we're supposed to. We show up because this is what we do. This is duty. This is what we've been doing. At best, it's a shallow effort to pacify our inner turmoil. We have the appearance of godliness, but hold anger, bitterness, and frustration with God within. And some of us are in a state of unforgiveness towards God. That's what this series is about. And this is what I came to tell you. It's okay to not be okay. In this series, we're giving you permission to feel again. To deal with those wounds again. To be able to uncover and call them out. If God is good, then why did my parents abandon me? If God is good, then why did, I let, they let, why did he let them touch me? If God is good, then why is misfortune constantly happening to me? If God is good, why isn't he fixing my situation? God wants you to know he sees you. Oh, don't get excited too quick. He's aware of your pain. He loves you. And yes, he permitted it. Is God good when life is not? My hope is by the end of this series, you'll be able to say yes. Not out of rote religiosity, but a true heart's affection. That understands that the sovereignty of God does not always mean the pathway is going to be easy. But his presence will be sure. God, I thank you. I thank you for this hard word. I thank you that we get to wrestle with this together as a church family. I thank you for a space where we can truly be authentic. And bring our cares to you. And Lord, we don't have to feel crazy anymore. We don't have to hide anymore. We don't have to pacify anymore. And act like everything is okay when internally we're dying. We don't have joy. We don't have passion. We don't have a connection. Lord, as each week goes by, may you lead us one step closer to healing in the hope that even while it's been bad, even while it's all bad. Even while it may get worse, you are still good. 